So a couple of days ago, we went for a cycle down by the river. There's a river down the down the valley from us along the shore there, and there were different people. So there, were lot, there were lots of people out, thank God, and uh, lots of cyclists and walkers and dog walkers and rollerbladers. And there's a, a place you can rent bikes up the river now, so people are renting bikes and just going for a little cycle back to to Clonmel and that. Anyway, lovely day, great to see it. And uh, we were cycling along, and in places the, 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 the track gets a wee bit narrow, and uh, so we have to kind of warn each other of oncoming vehicles or oncoming bikes. There's one particular situation where I had to roar back wide load because oh, I wasn't being offensive. Um, there, was a, there was a cyclist approaching with a trailer on the back uh, carrying a wee baba, a wee baby. Uh, and the wee baby was in the back on this trailer behind Daddy, who was pedaling like crazy. And the wee baby was just sitting there, just Wah! just roaring its head off uh, and crying like crazy. Uh, and nothing poor Dada could do, because obviously when you're on the track, you have to get the whole way to the end to get back to the car. So there's nothing you can do, baby's crying. And um, it, did, it reminded me of, of various situations in my life where you know the Lord's pulling me a direction I don't necessarily want to go, and I'm sitting in the back going, wah. Uh, but like, Dad knew what he was doing. Dad knows where he's going. Dad knows that uh, you know if you if you go too fast or if you go over the rough areas, you know, the child's going to get bounced out of it. Or if you don't go fast enough, then you just have to get home because the child's hungry or needs a bath or needs a nappy change or whatever it is. Dad knows what he's doing, uh, even though the child in the back mightn't necessarily agree. Uh, but Dad does know best. And so often in our lives and in our spiritual lives and even in our practical lives, you know, the the real world out there, our father does know best. He does know best, but we don't necessarily agree or see the bigger picture or we just want to get home or we just want to get into a bath or we just want to be comfortable or whatever it is. Uh, We just want this this problem or this difficulty to stop. And we just want everything to be okay. I just want to be comfortable again. I just want my blankie, you know, and it, it can happen that we don't like the direction that God is bringing us. Uh, this can often happen when we're trying to discern something as well, and we have certain options, and I, I just I don't know. I'm afraid. I'm afraid to do X or Y, because both are scary. I don't know. I don't know. In our gospel today, it's, it's such a simple image and such a simple idea with such global consequences for our lives. Whoever remains in me, with me in him, bears fruit in plenty. For cut off from me, you can do nothing. Cut off from me, you can do nothing. And no matter how often we hear that, I think we translate that in our brain as cut off from me, you can do lots of stuff but you can't work miracles, or you can't work on you can't walk on water. But you can do you can do a good share of things. I mean, you're pretty good on your own. And then I'm there just for the Sunday morning bits. You know, uh, God will kind of help you with a little bit of extraordinary grace the day of your baptism, confirmation, day you get married, whatever. But like 99.9% of the stuff we do, and then God just kind of helps out in the case of emergencies, right? He's like the fire department or uh, police service or something like when, whenever there's an emergency right? Uh, he's like an ambulance whenever there's an emergency he arrives but for most things we actually do them ourselves which is not what the gospel says the gospel says cut off from me you can do nothing nothing which means nothing that's what it means okay cut off from him we can do nothing uh, it reminds me of this, this story from the uh, book of the Judges all right. Very again, a very simple story of Gideon and the Midianites. So, uh, Gideon is, is is one of the judges, and obviously one of his roles there is to, is to protect his people, Israel. So they're about to be attacked by the Midianites, right? This ferocious, violent, uh, large army. So Gideon decides to protect his people and go up against them. Okay. So God speaks to him. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me, saying, My own strength has saved me. So now announce to the army, Anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. 
Okay, so of 32,000 of his men, 22,000 left. So now two-thirds of your army are gone, and you are outnumbered to begin with. Now you're down to 10,000 men, 10, men. So two-thirds of your army are gone, and what chance do you stand now? Well, not much, not much. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. No, there, no, there aren't. No, 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 there aren't really. Actually, um, I was just counting there, and we're, we really don't have too. We're not even close to having too many, Lord. Not, 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 not that I want to correct you or anything, but like <laughs> the Lord said to get in there, are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out there. If I say it to you, this one is to go with you. He shall go with you. If I say this one shall stay, he shall stay. Okay. So Gideon took the men down to the water. Then the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. So 300 of them drank with cupped hands and lapped like dogs. Right? This is important. The detail is always important. Okay? And the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said, with these 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Why is that important? Well, the guys who lapped are probably even less dignified and capable than those who kind of somewhat more, you know, go straight down to the water and just kind of drink it. These are the boys who, they're the savages, like, right? So, so he goes from having 32,000 to having 300 bog warriors. <laughs> you know, like, you can just imagine Gideon going, how we, how, how are we going to do this? But what is, see, what's the point? What is the, the, the whole point of it is if you win with your 32,000 people, Israel will say, my own strength has saved me. Now we think of parish pastoral councils, or we think of uh, parish renewal schemes, or we think of diocesan renewal schemes, and all of these things. Um, if we're doing any sort of mission or any sort of renewal, but we want to be patted on the back for its success, it deserves to fail. Because you have not put God at the centre, you want your name on a plaque. You want the recognition. You're not doing it for the greater glory of God. That's idolatry. And that will not succeed, nor does it deserve to. If the Lord isn't at the center, don't bother. Don't waste your time. Stay home. Watch Coronation Street. Because um, it's, if it's not God-centered, if it's not Christ-centered, it's a waste of time. Cut off from me. You can do nothing. Any initiative that isn't Christ-centered does not deserve to succeed. It doesn't. Because it's all about us then. It's all about us and me and me feeling important and I saved the parish I saved whatever ministry it was that's just vanity that's, that's, not, that's not the work of God so the Lord can actually even reduce our numbers in order to show that it's his work his ministry, his church his success for his glory so what does the Lord do with Gideon? well he gets these 300 bog warrior savages uh, to stand around in the peaks around where the Midianites are, are camped and he, uh, go, he's going to attack them with savage weapons. He has a jar. Each, each soldier gets a jar and a torch and a bugle, right? A horn. What are we going to do? Deafen him to death? <laughs> Just imagine all the soldiers going, this is insanity. But since they were savages, they probably didn't notice. They were like, <laughs> 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 all right. So... They stand in the hill all around the Midianites. Right? They have their, their torches in their jars. And then at Gideon's command, they break the jars and all the torches are revealed and then they blow their bugles. And the boys down below, the Midianites, look up and see all these torches and hear the clatter of breaking jars and bugles and think, we're surrounded, we're outnumbered. Ah! And they start attacking each other. Who betrayed us? Who betrayed us? Who gave away our position? Who? And they start slaughtering each other and then they run away. That's how it happened. So Gideon, without having to raise a sword, well, I almost got it wrong there. I was about to say Gideon without raising a sword won the battle. See, that's the whole point, you see. The whole point is that the Lord wins the battle. That's the whole point. The whole point is that, you know, we do what God wants, even though we're outnumbered and understaffed and underfunded. If we do what the Lord wants, in time it bears fruit. It works. It works. Because then we can't say we did it. We get in the way. Cut off from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. 
And we can say that phrase that positively, which the Lord does as well. Every branch that does bear fruit in me, he prunes. So cut off from him, we can do nothing. With him, we can do anything. With him, we can do anything. And it's such a, a consolation for, 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 for me as a priest or for you know, my, my community as a missionary community because like, we go to some places like Russia where and we have a couple of mission stations in Siberia and like, it's, uh, it's, it's not easy going because for generations the people have been lied to. The state lies to you, tells you that we're the richest country in the world, we're the most powerful country in the world. Um, they were told during communism that Americans live on the streets and eat from trash cans. Whereas we have, we are strong, we are many. We have our lines for food. So they, you line up and you get your slices of bread all free because there was no money, because people didn't have money. Uh, but they were told like, we were the most powerful nation in the world. Uh, we had some Russians in our community, really interesting conversations talking to real life Russians. Because um, they said, yes, we won two world war. I thought, wow. I'd never have thought of it that way. Millions of your people died. You were slaughtered. You know, Stalingrad, Leningrad. I mean, like it was just horrific. But bottom line, they found themselves yes on the right side, on the victorious side of of the battle. Like, but at what cost? But yeah, it's just this is what they were taught. Like, you know, we are strong. We are strong. We are many. Just lie to lie to lie to. You can't trust. You know, then if if you did practice your faith, your neighbor, your son, your daughter could betray you to the uh, authorities and you'd be arrested and they'd get a reward. So you live in constant fear of you know, everyone, everyone, anybody, and everybody could be a spy. We have another mission near the, uh, in, in the Czech Republic, very near the border to Austria. So uh, in a place called Budweis, people from there moved to America and started a company, I can't remember what it's called. Um, but so the, the place called Budweis. And um, because it was on the border, People were really suspicious of either Czechs trying to get over to Austria or Austrians trying to come over because it was the Iron Curtain and so on. So people there are still to this day so suspicious. They kind of everyone's kind of watching everyone else and strange, very strange. But like it's, it, it, it takes a long time to get over that kind of mentality and to allow the the, the, the truth and the peace and the, the brotherly love that our faith teaches us to seep into our hearts and to bear fruit. That doesn't happen overnight. So in our missions, often we have to push on, even though you don't necessarily see fruit for a generation, which is difficult. But do we believe that it's the Lord's mission or not? Do we believe that in time, he will reap the harvest or not? Do we believe that he is enough or not? Do we believe that his grace is sufficient or don't we? Do we or don't we? Do we believe that uh, what the, the, this gospel says? Like, cut off from me, you can do nothing. Make your home in me as I make mine in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit all by itself, but must remain part of the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine. I am the vine. You're the branches. You're the hands and the feet, but I'm, I'm the trunk. I'm, I'm what holds it all together. So you do your part, I'll, I'll do mine. Don't think that cut off from me, you're going to have an amazing mission, success, family, whatever it is. Cut off from him, we can't do anything. So we ask the good Lord today to renew our trust in him. These are the words of the Lord. These are the promises of Jesus. We ask that we may live in this promise today and draw from the truth of this promise. That Jesus is divine and we are the branches and so in him, we lack nothing. Amen.